This morning, I want to invite you to either read along on the screen or open your own Bible to Romans chapter 10. And we're going to dig in this morning, and we're going to talk about faith. Because, you know, here's the deal about faith. We all exercise faith each and every day. Did you know that? We all exercise faith each and every day. As a matter of fact, when Steve Chambers, our, um, our worship pastor, came to me and said, Hey, listen, uh, this guy named uh, Jaron Davis is called, and he wants to come and sing. And, you know, what do you think? I said, I don't know. Because, you, you know, we got the pastor's kids here on the front row. You know how those calls come in on the weekly basis and all that? And, well, you know, he wrote Holy Ground. Well, I don't know. You know? But we exercise this faith that it's going to be a great day of worship together. And we invited them anyway, right? We exercise faith. Aren't you glad we did? You know, it's been a blessing. And, and we exercise faith in everything we do. We, we exercise faith when we lie down at night that we'll wake up in the morning. We exercise faith that when we drive down the highway, we're going to get to our destination. We exercise faith over and over and over again. But, you know, as much as we exercise faith, there are different qualities of, of, of faith. You know, just like there's different qualities of chocolate. Amen? Well, there's different qualities of faith. You know, I can have faith in, in one thing that may have, you know, that deserves a little bit of faith, but then I can have faith in something else that deserves much greater faith, much more trusting faith, so to speak. And Paul, when he writes to the Romans, he's, he's talking about what saving faith is all about because, you know, after all, we are a, as a government calls us, a faith-based organization, Right? But we're much more than that. We're the church of the living God. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We are the eschatological community of the redeemed. I love to get to say that. Because I'm looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ comes back. But when Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 10, and we're going to pick up with verse number 11, he says this, For even the script, for Scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There it is, belief, faith. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be, will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord... Who has believed our report? You know, sometimes I ask that same question. Lord, who's believed the report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold, and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So what we find here is, a, is, a, is an amazing paragraph on this thing called faith. And the reason I wanted to talk about faith is, you know, we've, we've been talking about repentance. We've come from the solemn day of assembly, and we've talked about our repentance, and we've talked about this faith in Jesus Christ. But what does it really mean? What is that saving faith? And, and we've got this banner that overrides everything we're about right now here at Village called Greater Things. And I want to tell you that no matter what you put your faith in out there, the greater thing is to have a faith that's in God that saves and redeems and, and sets your life in the place of of, of obtaining all those things that God has for you. So how does that come about? Because that kind of a faith, it inspires, it, it magnifies, it uplifts, it moves, it's magnificent. The very act of believing God changes our human faith into, an, into a saving faith, into an effective faith. But how does it come about? Well, as I was riding down the beach road the other morning, I was thinking about, okay, Lord, what, how does this outline work out in my mind? You know, I'm I'm thinking on it. I've studied this passage. I'm trying to put it together. How do I begin? Because I don't want to say the beginning of, of faith. But the sun, you know, is just kind of rising up. And this is what I thought. Brilliant idea. The dawn of saving faith. 
See, there it's on the screen. It must be from God, right? The dawn of saving faith. Well, listen to what the Scripture says. It was in our text, Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So this tells us that there's two things that must be involved in this dawn of saving faith. There must be a heralding of the gospel because nobody can hear unless it's heralded, unless it's shouted from the rooftops, unless it's shouted all over. I've awakened many a morning in Islamic nations in which I've heard the calls for prayer like at 5 a.m. The sun's not anywhere near to shining and the, the rooster's not ready to crow yet. But there's that call for prayer, that heralding, that going out. And here is something even greater than, than the Muslims' call to prayer. It's a call to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. That's what that word of Christ is. It's what it means. It means the gospel. It means the good news that God loved you, God loved me, God loved us. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin in a little town called Bethlehem. And he grew up, and one day he began a, a mission uh, and a ministry of itinerant preaching, traveling around, proclaiming the kingdom of God and that he was the Christ. And then in the three-year ministry, he, he was taken and arrested. He was beaten, and he was crucified. And the authorities thought he had him shut up. And Satan thought he had it closed down. But he was placed in a borrowed tomb because he wouldn't need it very long. And on the third day, he arose. He arose. He led captivity captive. He, he did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. And the Bible says not only did he arise, but he ascended on high and went back to heaven. And the Bible says that this same Jesus, that's why I'm excited about the eschatology of it, this same Jesus will return. And that's what's so cool. But that's that good news. That's the gospel. It's the heralding. It's the passing on of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't matter if it's through a personal conversation or if it's through the preaching of the word as, as I'm doing here from the platform or if it's in written form or if it's uh, over the radio waves, but it's got to be heralded. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a, a, a former uh, Muslim who had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He was educating himself. He had been to school and stuff, and he was trying to practice his English. And, and it's amazing how God can even use the track of a, of a cult to bring and point somebody to Jesus. And so uh, he was reading a track um, in, in his language in Arabic that was produced by the Jehovah's Witnesses in the Watchtower publication. And that kind of jarred his interest, and so he went and found a copy of a Bible, which is kind of hard to do, but he found one, and it was in French. And so he thought, well, I'll begin to learn French. And, and, and here he is, and as he's doing this, somehow or another he gets a hold of a radio. And that radio is positioned on a particular radio channel where the gospel is being preached by one of his, uh, one of the people of his culture. I'm trying to be real careful so I don't identify exactly where it is because we pay for these radio broadcasts, okay? And we produce them and they come out of Spain and they go across the Mediterranean, powerful radio broadcast. And this is really funny. I mean, where people ride donkeys and ride camels and all, they still have all cell phones. We give them an 800 number <laughs> if you want to receive Christ. Is that not cool? And he dials the 800 number. And so one of his fellow countrymen, along with one of our workers, goes and meets him. And this man becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. And God used all kinds of ways to herald it to him. But not only must there be a heralding of that gospel, there's got to be a hearing of it as well. Listen, he says, so faith comes from hearing. So the gospel must not only be proclaimed and heralded, it's got to be heard as well. To, as well, It's got to be listened to. And, and when the Lord Jesus Christ was doing his ministry on earth, remember, he's walking around and, you know, he comes across the blind guy, makes him see. He, he makes the, the deaf person uh, hear. He, he, he talks to the woman at the well and, and gives her a, a hope for life. And he's doing all these things. And this is what he's continuously saying as he does his ministry. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew something about the way we listen. 
And in John chapter 5, verse number 25, the Bible says, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, were, was he talking about people in the grave? No, he's talking about people who are walking around alive. But although people are walking around alive, they're walking around dead. What do I mean by that? Well, remember when, when God uh, created man and, and woman, Adam and Eve? Remember them in the book of Genesis? And, and God said, you know, you've got this garden. It's a great garden. It doesn't have thorns. It doesn't have thistles. It's a beautiful place. But one thing you can't do, you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of that tree, in that day you will die. Well, everything's kind of good, and uh, Eve's out by the tree one day, and the old serpent, Satan, shows up and says, some pretty fruit, isn't it? And she took it and ate it. She gave it to Adam, and he ate it. And they knew that they were naked, but did they die right then? Because God said, in the day that you eat it, you'll die. Well, they did. We just don't understand that oftentimes. Remember Paul, he wrote the Thessalonians, and he talked about our makeup, that we've got a body, and we've got a soul, and we've got a spirit. And with our body, we know the world beneath us. In other words, our five senses. And with our soul, we know the world around us. That's our intellect, our mind. And with our spirit, we know God. Immediately, the separation came. Immediately, there's a separation between man and God. And immediately, there was a spiritual death. And there would be a progressive um, uh, death of the soul in the way that we think. And there would be an ultimate death of the body. And so, what Jesus is saying is he's saying he'll make those who are dead, he'll make them alive when they hear. Well, how do we hear? Well, we have to hear intelligently, and, and this, is, this is amazing, and, and this is why I talk so fast, is because you can comprehend up to 500, wor or you can comprehend up to 500 words a minute. Did you understand that? You can comprehend up into 500 words a minute, but actually we speak at about 125 to 130 words a minute. Now, here's the deal about, about that speaking. Psychologists tell us that 80% of the time that we are awake... We are communicating. Wow. 80% of the time that we're awake, we're in the process of communicating. And of that time, 45% or 27 minutes an hour are listening. Guys, you can tell your wives that. Honey, I'm listening. 45% of the time, 27 minutes. Now, here's the bad news. Of that, you know, uh, 27 minutes, only 27, 25% of that time is devoted to effective listening. It's called vague listening. You know, you hear it going on all around you, but you're not really so absorbing it. And like, you know, you walk in the room, and somebody's watching the news and reading the paper or reading a book, and you say, well, what are they saying on the TV? You say, well, I don't know. I'm not really paying attention. They're listening, but they're not paying attention. You know, it's kind of a, a vague kind of thing. And then some people, they listen, you know, in all kinds of ways. Sometimes people are just uncritical. They take anything somebody says. Well, well the preacher said it. It must be true. You know, there's a lot of guys out there that have this title preacher that are saying things that are not necessarily true. And it can't be backed up by the biblical record that God has given to us. And so, you know, it's not an uncritical kind of, uh, of communication. And, you know, some people, they're just superstitious. Well, I'm not going to listen to that because, you know, this is, this is what I believe. This is the way I was raised. It's what I've, been, I've held on to my entire life. And then some people, you know, they just listen, listen fictitiously and they make up all this stuff about it as they go along the way. But when we talk about the preaching of the gospel, the heralding of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel sweeps away all those superficial types of listening and claims the attention of the mind and of the heart and of the will. Now, there's a young lady in the book of Acts by the name of Lydia. And the Bible says that Lydia listened to the Apostle Paul, and the Bible says that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. What does it mean to heed? It means to obey. To obey. So, you know, she intelligently listened. The Lord opened up her heart to heed those things, and then she obediently heard the Word of God. Remember, so faith comes by hearing, so obedient hearing produces this, according to Romans 16, 26. 
It's by the scriptures and the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made to known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. So it brings us to that place of obedience. As a matter of fact, James, the brother of Jesus, he puts it this way in James chapter 2, in verse number 26. He said, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You know, so uh, what the Lord's teaching us here in the Scripture is not only do I intelligently hear, you know, but I've got to intelligently put it into practice. I've got to obey what I believe. If I believe it, if it's a part of who I am, that means that a part of who I am is going to be a part of the way that I behave and the way that I carry on. If I have that kind of a faith, there ought to be certain evidences that are there. There ought to be certain fruit in my life, peace, joy, uh, Peace, uh, peace, joy, love, song, long suffering, and the, uh, patience, and all those kinds of things. And such, such things, there is no law. These are all good things. These are all good qualities. I may not have peace every day, and I may not have joy every moment. But that's the, the predominant ruling thing in my life because the Spirit has come to live within. And in that process, I'm not going to be just a self-centered individual because what's happened in the process of, of, of listening with an intelligent ear and walking in obedience is I have come to the conclusion that I am not God anymore. Really. Have you ever heard of the theology of cats and dogs? Did you ever see that movie, Cats and Dogs? And there's a little book out, you know, Steve Chambers, our worship pastor, that's his theology book on his table. I couldn't help but notice it, the theology of cats and dogs. And you know the difference between the theology of a cat and the theology of a dog? A cat thinks this. Why, he feeds me. He changes my litter box. He lets me in and out of the door. I must be God. The dog says, he feeds me, he walks me, he lets me go with him as he goes. He must be God. And, and so, you know, what we begin to learn is there's a certain obedience in our lives. And, and in that process of obedience, we're going because it's not centered on us anymore. It's centered on walking with the Lord and glorifying his name and, 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 and being a herald of that gospel as we go. And, you know, I, I applaud you. I challenged you last week to, to bring in how many cans of fruit this week? Who remembers? A thousand. And we're up, over, uh, we're up over 800 right now. And next Saturday, we're going to Bruce. We need carpenters and we need painters. We need about 40 of you. And some people say, well, I don't know how to do carpentry. Sometimes all we need you to do is to pull a nail because we reclaim lumber. To, to reuse as we build some things and work with them. Uh, the Muscogee Indian uh, tribe up there in a uh, very desperate situation, and we're partnered with a couple other churches as we're working to, to help bring the, the hope and the love of the gospel into that neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing fruit. We're feeding these folks, and we're doing all these kinds of things. And, you know, if you don't think you can do carpentry, we'll let you paint. And, you know, you don't have to worry about being that neat. Just be a three-coat painter, one on the wall, one on yourself, and one on the person beside you. We'll let you in. But, you know, it's, it's that faith, that, and, and we're not going there in order to have faith, but because of our faith, because we believe that God is the answer. We believe he has greater things for us and for the world that surround us that we go and that we proclaim that good news. So, you know, that's, that's an awesome deal. But, you know, it, it's great to know all about that, right? It's all it's great to know about the, the, the dawning of faith. But so what? What does faith really do? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever been in one of those moods when you sat down and said, well, well, what does faith really do? Well, that's a great question because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the activity of faith is rather busy because this is what it does. It makes a level playing field for every single one of us. Paul writes here in our text, verses 11 and 12, and he says that, that uh, for the scripture says that whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Now, let me ask you this before I read on. How many of you, having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, have ever been disappointed by him? Nobody has been disappointed by Jesus or you've been disappointed by Jesus? Jesus doesn't disappoint us. He, he works in our hearts. He works in our lives. And then the Bible says, for there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. And that's important. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. 
Faith, what it does, it places all of us in the very same position with regard to the grace of God. Faith minimizes our merits, and it magnifies His mercy. Faith minimizes my merits, and it magnifies His mercy. Because just think about this. You know, everybody is not the same. You know, you look across this room in here. You know, we're different folks. You know, some of us are, are tall and some are short and some are round and some are not so round. And, you know, some are uh, of uh, different cultural and uh, ethnic descents. And, and, and just think, God loves every single one of us. He cares about every single one of us. There's all kinds of different ages. There's all kinds of different uh, interests. But God loves us all, and we've all been created uniquely in his image that we might glorify him in our life. And just think of this. If God uh, in his salvation, if our salvation was based upon race, what would happen to, to all the, the, the other peoples of the world? And if our salvation was based upon riches, what would happen to the most despised uh, of those who are too poor to pay? And if it were based upon our rank in society, what about those that couldn't climb to our social status? And if it were based upon our reading, what would happen to those who didn't have our academic ability? And if it were based upon all these other kinds of things, our, our football team, what would happen to all those other folks? And if it were based upon well, me being a good guy, what would happen to the guy who wasn't a good guy? If it was based upon me being American, what would happen to the Ethiopian? It's not based on those things whatsoever. It makes a level playing field for every single one of us. There's nobody that can walk up and say, based on my merit and based on my ability, you know, I am in. And on this very same uh, level, he brings us all up for those who've been in the gutter, for those who've been down in life, who've been covered in fault and failure and, and, and wiped out. You know, there's nobody that's too bad for the grace of God. He makes a level playing field for every single one of us. And when he makes that level playing field for every single one of us, this is what it does. It leads us to the Christ of the gospel. Who is the Christ of the gospel? You know, the, the Christ of the gospel is not necessarily the Christ who's always proclaimed by the television preacher. Do you understand that? I mean, if Jesus wants to make you rich, why hasn't he made everybody in the world rich that calls on Jesus? That's not the Christ of the gospel. Let me tell you about the Christ of the gospel. The Christ of the gospel is the one for whom it's written about that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And here's the deal. It's impossible to hear the gospel preached in all of its fullness and all of its richness without being led to this Christ. For he alone. He alone holds the key for the greater things in your life. He alone holds the key for the greater things in this church. He alone holds the key for the greater things in this world. For he alone, there's nobody else like him. He is austerely unique. He alone is the Savior of the world. That's who Jesus is. And so the Bible tells us in the book of Acts in chapter 4, and there is salvation in no one else. Mohammed couldn't do it. Buddha couldn't do it. Uh, you know, Oprah can't do it. The book, The Secret, is not going to give you the answer. There's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And it's so simple. Faith. What a simple word, a little acrostic. You've probably heard it before. Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. And you know, we think, wow, you know, that's just way, way too simple. The, but can you grab this, that God had to make it simple for us? He did. Because, you know, we're hard-headed. How many of you are married to somebody that's hard-headed? I thought that'd get your attention. You know, we, we all know at least somebody that's hard-headed. And, and then sometimes we just, need, we just need simplicity. 
don't we? We just need it to, to work when we pull it out. And that's what this faith is. It is simple. And, and God loves us that much to give us this simple thing. And, 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 and what's so simple about it is this. Is Jesus came from heaven to earth. And he went from the earth to the grave and from the sky, grave to the sky. He arose. It's just that simple. And this is what Jesus said. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You see how simple that is? And, and you know what? You know, every, every kid knows how to sing. Jesus loves me. And you know what the most popular song for older adults is? No, it's not Amazing Grace. Don't mess up my illustration. It's Jesus loves me. She's turning red. I shouldn't have been that way, huh? <laughs> Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's just that simple. And so if I forsake all and trust him, that means I'm not going to let those other things hold me back. Like yesterday, we were playing basketball. I coach this girls' basketball team, of which my daughter's a part. And uh, uh, there's another girl here in our church that, that's a part of that basketball team. And, and, you know, we're great. I mean, technically, we've won every game. <laughs> well, the reason is the first game that counted. We beat that team. We scrimmaged them every Thursday night, and they never beat us. But the first game, somehow or another, they beat us. I don't know what the deal was. So technically, it was a win, right? But, you know, Elena, uh, somebody uh, said, Elena, wave your hand so everybody see who you are. Come on, you can't wave it down. Put it up there. You know, I can bring you up here on stage. You can ask Jaron that because his daddy did that to him. Right? Okay. But, you know, she looks pretty good out on the basketball court. And, uh, but she was telling me, Dad, they keep holding my shirt and pulling me back. And I'm saying, you just rip away from them and charge on. You know, all three, t all of them that are gardener, you know. And, and, and that's the way it is with those things that want to hold us back. Listen, you know, the world doesn't want to see you move to the greater things. Satan doesn't want, doesn't want to see you move to the greater things. Those old friends that are, are held back, they don't want to see you come out of the miry pit and place your feet upon solid ground. They want to hold you back. And here's the deal about our faith. We just rip and roll with God. And let him set us free. For the Bible says where the Spirit is, there is freedom. So how do I know if I've got it? What's that affirmation? What's the affirmation of that saving faith? The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. What is that affirmation? Well, the Bible teaches us what it is. What this saving faith is, it's first of all a confession of Jesus Christ as Savior. He's not one of many saviors. He is the only savior. And this is what the Bible says. With the mouth he confesses, Romans 10, 9, resulting in salvation. Saving faith leads people to the Savior Jesus Christ, a savior who saves us from the penalty of sin and from the, the power of sin and one day from the presence of sin. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 59, verse number 2, he said, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. You know, this morning I was holding my granddaughter. She was kind of, you know, just calm and just wanting to be, you know, loved on while I drank a little coffee. And I think about that. Didn't we all kind of start off that way? Just sweet, innocent little babies. What happened? What happened? What a mess. You know, I listen to the news and, 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 and I get sad and I get overwhelmed and I don't understand how mean people can be. I mean, I don't get it. I don't know how these people hurt little kids. You know, I, I just want to skip the, the, the trial and go right on to the execution. 
You know, cut out all the middle stuff. I don't understand it. I don't understand, you know, the meanness of the world where brother can rise against brother and nation can rise against nation when I look at the innocence of a little baby. But this is what I know. It's because Adam sinned and because Eve sinned. I've inherited a sin nature. And I am a sinner both by choice and by nature. You know, by nature, I'm born in sin. I'm, I'm separated from God. And in choice, sometimes I just choose to do that which I ought not to do. Can you identify with me on that? And I need a Savior. It's kind of like, you know, Dr. Ewing teaching the nutrition class on Wednesday night. He's laying out the stuff that we ought to do and ought not to do. And when he laid out the thing that very first Wednesday night about how we ought not to be eating french fries, I thought, shoot. And, you know, ever since then, I, every time I pass the McDonald's, the steering wheel does that. But I ha I, I've gotten control of it. Because I didn't want to be seen by Wayne Fisher, who I saw in the drive-thru, getting his french fries. <laughs> but isn't that the way sin gets a hold of us? But listen to the promise of God. This is the promise of God speaking to Mary and speaking of Mary that she'll bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus. And this is what he'll do. He will save his people from their sin. Jesus Christ, the innocent, the pure, the loving, the powerful, the almighty, yet the humble Son of God comes and takes on our humanity so that we through his poverty might take on his royalty. And this is what the Bible says in verse 13 of our text, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. So it's a confession, and, and it's a confession with Jesus Christ as Savior, but it's also a confession with him as Lord. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What's the name of Jesus? The Lord Jesus. In another place, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, Therefore I make known to you that which uh, no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is, a, is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What does that lordship mean? It means that I hand over the, role, the, the controls, the reins of my life to Jesus Christ. I'm not in charge anymore. I'm not guiding my own destiny. I recognize that I'm not a cat anymore. I'm just a dog. And he walks me. He does. That, there's, a lot, there's a lot of truth in that. God is walking you through life. And he's providing for me. He feeds me and he waters me. He takes care of me. And he's my Lord. And I am the sheep of his pasture. And you realize that without the lordship of Jesus Christ, and this is why some of you are struggling. If you don't acknowledge that, you're either apostate, you've sl you slipped away, or you've never been redeemed. And without the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, you're not going to have the life of Jesus Christ in your life. In other words, you're not going to have the greater things. And God wants you to have greater things. He wants to see you rise up with wings of eagles. He wants to see you run and not get tired, to walk and not get weary. He wants to see you be victorious. And the Bible says that he has made us more than victors in this world. He has made us overcomers. He has made us conquerors. As Jaron's song says in the latter part of the verses, Reach out and touch it for the place where we're standing is holy ground. And here's the deal. That's what you got to do. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the essence of idolatry is the entertaining of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. And you know what we do? We're standing in the place that's holy. We're surrounded by God's people. God's moving and God's working. And every week, this is what we do. We say, I'm going to put it off. I'm 19 years old. 
I've got to have some fun. I've got to sow some wild oats. I'm 15 years old. I'll put it off till I'm 21, or I'll put it off till I'm 30. And you know what always amazes me every year during this wonderful time of snowbird year of the season? is generally there's a snowbird in their 80s that finally comes to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And you know what happens? It's just a glorious thing to think that God could do that in a life that's practiced virtual idolatry for all those years and putting him off. God loves you, and he cares about you. You know, we've talked about standing before God in that solemn assembly and you know, just being the people that God wanted us to be. We've talked about what repentance means today. It's about what really saving faith is. I mean, these are basics. But we've got to have the basics in our lives in order to be the radically transformed followers of Jesus Christ that he's called us to be and to live under that umbrella of those greater things. You know, my desire for you, if you don't know Jesus Christ today, is that you'd accept that greater thing of him because he sets your whole life in order. It's real easy. It's not praying, a, you know, what we call a sinner's prayer, you know, dear Lord, yada, 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 yada. But it's in your heart turning to Jesus and with your mouth saying, you are the Christ and you are the Lord. Come and live in me. And he'll do that. Some of you need to take a step of obedience. You've, you've, you've done that but you've not taken that step under his lordship. You, you've been feeling that nudge. I need to be baptized like other people I see being baptized. Sometimes they're young, sometimes they're old, sometimes they're in between. Lord, I want to be obedient. Step out and do that. Some of you, he's been leading to be a part of this church family, and you need to do that today. Right now, I'm going to pray. Jaron's going to come back up.